Hello, everyone. Welcome to Biofluid Mechanics. And um, I'll be uh, delivering these uh, next few lectures online. And uh, I'll be dividing every lecture into three parts. First of all, I'm going to be uh, recording a lecture with a webcam and uh, or a section of the lecture with a webcam, webcam with an introduction to discuss what we are going to be doing for the session. Then I'm going to be uh, posting a video of, um, of the notes and, uh, and the derivation of the different uh, models uh, for each of the sessions. And then finally, I'm going to be uh, doing a screen recording where I'll do a demonstration of the implementation of the model that we derive in, in that particular session uh, in MathCAD. So uh, today we are going to extend the, uh, uh, the formulation that we've been uh, going over in class uh, about the circuits with uh, resistances, inductances, and compliance. And remember that we've implemented these elements uh, to simulate uh, uh, different effects in the cardiovascular system. So as for example, the resistance uh, simulates the, the viscous uh, uh, resistance, the flow. Uh, the inductance simulates basically the inertia, while the compliance or the capacitor uh, simulates the compliance of the vessel. So we call these an RLC model or resistance inductance compliance. Um, in the uh, particular example that we went over last class, we, we looked at a situation where all these three elements were imposed in series. So we had the resistance, the inductance, and the capacitor in series. And, uh, and it actually we were actually able to the, derive an equation, a second order differential equation for this system, and break it up into two uh, 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 coupled first order equations and solve it with the uh, different numerical integrators that we've been going over in class. However, when we looked at the solution, we noticed uh, that the flow was actually reversing at some points of the, of the cycle. And this is precisely because the, induct, the uh, compliance, the capacitor was actually placed in series with the other two elements of the RLC circuit. Uh, and this is what the compliance will do exactly. It will receive flow and it will actually uh, eject flow when, when the conditions and the pressure in the system actually dictate that. So, we have we had talked about the uh, this in the past, and we've talked about this in, in previous lectures, where it, where in fact the the proper way to model a, a, a hydrodynamic circuit using these three components in, a, in an electric circuit would be to place the resistor and the inductor in series while placing the the compliance or the or the capacitor in parallel, so that it actually can absorb flow from the from the circuit and release it over to the circuit whenever necessary or whenever the situation uh, merits that. Uh, and this, in fact, will actually model and simulate the effect of the vessel itself complying and contracting. Um, and this is precisely what we want to do. So in the formulation today, we'll go over that and we'll call these the RLC compartments. And, uh, and you'll see how we can actually derive the equations and then finally implement those equations to be, to be able to solve them in, in, in the algorithm. So um, I'll be stopping here and then go into the next, uh, the next video where we'll actually do the, the note taking. Okay, so this is uh, biofluid mechanics. And this is lecture number 17. So as I mentioned, we are going to look at a simple RLC cardiovascular cir circuit. With parallel compliance. And this will, in fact, help us simulate what the compliance of the vessel will actually do. So we start with the pump. Uh, it simulates the heart. So we have this uh, pump and then we have a resistor. We have an inductance. And now we're going to place the compliance C in parallel with those two elements. And then we're going to close the mesh or the loop. So we are going to look at this point here. This is what we're going to call pressure one. Um, 
this is QA. We're gonna call this Q of the pump. We're gonna call this Q2. And whatever is left here, this point here, we're gonna call pressure two. And whatever is left of the flow here, we're gonna call QB. So we, we essentially, um, denote the compliance in parallel or state the compliance in parallel with the resistance and the inductance. Uh, the compliance will essentially absorb flow when this pressure is high and release flow back into the circuit when this pressure is low. So essentially doing what a vessel would do uh, in terms of absorbing and releasing the flow when it complies. Okay, so um, if we were to derive these equations, and by the way, we're gonna keep using this nomenclatures, letters for the flows and numbers for the pressures, except for uh, flows associated with a compliance for which we use a number Q2 in this case, okay? So um, let's look at the equations. So in between one and two, in between notes one and two, we have a resistor and, a, and an inductor. So in between those two pressures, we know that the pressure drop P1 minus P2 is proportional to the uh, inductance times the derivative of the flow with respect to time plus the resistor times the flow. So this is Ohm's law and this is Henry's law. And that's what contributes to the pressure drop between this point and this point. The other law we have is the law of the compliance right here. Um, and, uh, and it says basically that the compliance times the pressure at pressure at point two, the derivative of the pressure at point two is equal to the flow that will go to this compliance Q2. So if you look at these equations, well, we have two first order equations, right? So this is the highest order derivative on each of, uh, on each of these equations is the first order derivative. But we have a number of unknowns. We have P1, we have P2, we have Q, uh, and we can call this actually, just to be say QA. This is a Q that passes through the resistor and the inductance. So we have P1, P2, QA, that's three. And then we have Q2, that's four. So notice that there are four unknowns. Let's list them here, P1, P2, QA, Q2, and only two equations. Therefore, not enough. So we need to either derive additional equations, uh, at least two additional equations to be able to solve for these unknowns, or come up with ways of reducing the number of unknowns from these two equations. So additional equations may be formulated through KCL and KVL. So these are the Kirchhoff current law and the Kirchhoff uh, voltage law. These are the laws that are going to help us actually derive the necessary equations so that we can attempt to solve that system. And by the way, notice that we are not assuming that we know we are going to be able to know the exact solution to this to this particular problem. We're not. Uh, what we're going to have to do is rely on the numerical solution process that we've actually been working on in class. So if you look at the Kirchhoff current law and we apply that at note number one of the circuit, so if I go back here, note number one would mean that uh, the flow that comes in is equal to the sum of the flows that come into this node is equal to the sum of the flows that go out of this node. And what we basically find is uh, that uh, QB and QA are exactly the same, which is equal to QP. So 
Uh, QP and QB are the same. Remember, this actually traverses the entire way unless there's any leaks on the circuit. Uh, the QA and QB are equal to each other. So QA is equal to QB. If we apply KCL at node number two, so on this node, we have one flow coming in, which is QA, and we have two flows coming out, which is Q2 and QB. So we have QA has to be equal to QB plus Q2. Okay, so right off the bat, we see that there's a some kind of incongruency here because how can QA be equal to QB, but also QA is equal to QB plus Q2. So one of those two is gonna have to be zero and that's gonna come out naturally when we try to solve these equations. Okay, so note that if QA is equal to QB from equation two plus Q2, but QA is equal to, or QB is equal to QA from equation one, then I'm calling this Q, I'm gonna call this, just to avoid confusion, instead of Q2, I'm gonna call it QC. The Q at the compliance. So QC, all right, so, and this is QC. So if QA is equal to QB plus QC and QA, QB is equal to QA, then basically the conclusion is if we take this QA to the left-hand side, cancel it with this one, is that QC is equal to zero. So we've already essentially solved for one of the unknowns. We don't need to create additional equations. This is an equation, just QC is equal to zero. Now if we apply KVL in the entire circuit. Remember that this is a mesh rule. The sum of all the pressures or the pressure drops or the potential differences throughout a, a closed mesh should uh, actually equal zero. So P1 minus P2 plus the pressure between P2 or the pressure drop between P2 and P1, which is the negative of delta P should be equal to zero. So whatever pressure drop we have between P1 and P2 has to equal whatever pressure gain we have at the pump. So KVL essentially says that P1 of time minus P2 of time should be equal to delta P of the pump, which is a known quantity. So the, the pump is actually in pre-imposed. So if we go back to the equations, these are on. So we have delta P of the pump, this is equation one, is equal to L dQA dt plus r q a of t and we have c dp2 dt is equal to qc which is equal to zero so now we have only two unknowns qa and p2 so rearranging this it's very important that we rearrange all equations in the way we can actually use to implement the numerical integrator, the runge kuta or Hoynes or whatever numerical integration technique we're actually attempting. So we isolate the derivative on the left-hand side of the equation and move everything else, everything else to the right. So in here we have dqa dt is equal to minus r over l qa of t. I can add a zero plus zero times P2. Nothing multiplies P2 in this equation. And then we have a plus one over L delta P of the pump. And in the second equation, we have dP2 dT of T is equal to, well, nothing multiplies uh, QA. So zero times QA on this equation. Nothing multiplies P2. And that's it, dp2 dt is equal to zero. So that's, those are the two equations. So notice that we have two equations with two unknowns. One of them is qa of t and the other one is p2 
of t. Notice that these equations are decoupled, meaning that I can solve for one without solving the other because the first equation does not depend on P2 and the second equation does not depend on QA. So I can solve the first equation without knowing what the second equation solution is, and I can solve the second equation without knowing what the first equation solution is. More importantly, if I look at the second equation, it just basically says dp2 dt is equal to zero from equation two. Notice that dp2 dt is equal to zero. That means that p2 of t is equal to a constant. It's equal to a constant. So that's the answer. It's just a constant. And we impose some initial condition. If we're told that the pressure two at time equals zero is equal to 10, then that will be the value throughout the entire cycles or the collection of cycles. So that's the answer. So essentially what's happening here is that the, the compliance plays no role in this particular circuit. This is simply an RL circuit. The circuit that we drew here, where we have a resistance and an inductor in series and a compliance in parallel, the way it's actually written right now, and this, the, the way it actually will work, is that the compliance will play no role. It doesn't matter what the pressure is doing in the circuit, it is not going to absorb or release any, any flow. The pressure here will be constant, and essentially the only thing acting on the circuit is R and L. And we can solve this problem because this is just simply equation number one, which is this equation right here, is a first order differential equation for which we know what the analytical solution is. Very simple, we've done it many times. It's just the first kind of equations that we confront. So if we have a system like this, the compliance actually plays no role. It's doing nothing. So in order for these type of compartments, we call this an RLC compartment, where we have resistance, compliance, and inductance, in order for them to actually act the way they should, we should have more than one. Or to act the way if you actually, we actually expect them to, we should have more than one. So I'm going to stop here, and then we're going to look at a different example uh, um, in, a, in a different part of this particular lecture. All right, so how about now we... at two RLC compartments in series with each other. So let's see, we have uh, again the pump. So this is the uh, key of the pump going through the pump. And then we have we're going to start here with pressure zero. Change the nomenclatures a little bit. And use letters for the resistance and the inductance. Then the first compliance here at node P1. And we're going to call this C1. Um, so the flow QA goes through resistance and inductance RA and LA. Well, Q1 goes here through compliance one, and then we continue to another resistance, RB, and another inductance, LB, another point, P2. Connecting to C2. So here we have QB. And here we have Q2. And then what remains here is QC. And you can tell right away that QC is equal to QP, which is equal to QA, because they all merge on node number zero, which is the same. There's one in and one out there to node number zero. 
All right, so we have two compartments, two RLC compartments, and let's see if this works now, where they're actually the two compartments or the two, uh, the two compliance actually play any role in simulating the compliance of the vessel. So let's look at the equations. So between node zero and one, we have a pressure drop, P0 minus P1, and that is equivalent or proportional to and Reese law and Ohm's law. Okay, so the pressure is going to drop from P0 to P1 as a function of the flow and the resistance and the derivative of the flow and the inductance. Okay, we also have um, C1 times dP1 dt is equal to Q1. Well, the pressure drop from P1 to P2 P1 minus P2 is equivalent to LB dQB dt plus RB QBT. And we apply Faraday's law here too on the other capacitor. So the amount of how the pressure changes as a function of time determines how much flow goes in to the compliance. So notice that by um, definition, we draw these flows going into the compliance, right, out of the node P1 and P2. Uh, so, but that flow can actually go in reverse. So just, this is essentially saying that if the if the pressure rate, if the if the time rate of change of the pressure at node number one is positive, there will be flow going into the compliance. But if the time rate of change of the pressure at node one is negative, so the pressure is changing, is actually decreasing as a function of time, this number is negative, then Q1 will actually be released from the compliance back into the system. So the flow is never lost, it's actually absorbed and released by the compliance depending on what the pressure, uh, the, the time change, the rate of change of the pressure is doing here and at this point. All right, so again, we have these four equations. So notice that the total number of equations, in this case four, equals the total number of inductances and the total number of capacitors or compliances. And this is a rule that we'll follow. The number of equations that will actually result of any system, regardless of how complicated or complex it is, is going to be equal to the number of inductances plus the number of compliances we have in the system. For every compliance, we'll have an equation of the kind C times dPdt, C times dPdt, for every inductance, we'll have an equation of the kind dQt, dQt. Okay, so this is the total number of equations that we'll have in the system. However, notice that uh, where are the unknowns? We have P0, P1, QA, Q1, P2, QB, and Q2. A total of seven unknowns. We have four equations with seven unknowns. So again, we have to rely on KCL and KVL to reduce the number of unknowns so that we can end up with four unknowns. All right, so let's see how we do this. All right, so if we apply KCL at node zero, that would be this node right here, we notice that going in is QP and going out is QA, but QP and QC are exactly the same. This is exactly the same line. So we know that QP is equal to QA. We apply KCL at note one. And note number one, we notice that QA goes in and out go Q1 and QB. So QA is equal to Q1 plus QB. KCL at node number two, 
into node number two goes QB and out of node number two goes Q2 and QC. So QB goes in and now it goes Q2 plus QC. But note that QC is equal to QP. Same thing. Again, C is the same flow rate that goes to the pump. There's no bifurcations anywhere. There's no leaking. So these are all the same. QA, QP, and QC are all the same. No need to have different unknowns for those. So basically, we can solve for Q1 out of this equation. Q1 of T is equal to QA minus QB. And uh, we can solve for Q2 out of this equation. And Q2 is equal to QB minus QC, which we know is equal to QP, which is equal to QA. So essentially, this Q1 is equal to QA minus QB, while Q2 is equal to QB minus QA. So we we'll essentially can re replace in this four equations right here, we can replace Q1 and Q2 with QA minus QB and QB minus QA, essentially reducing the number of unknowns, eliminating two of the seven unknowns, which should be down to five. Okay. Now, KVL says that pressure drop from zero to one plus the pressure drop from one to two should be equal to the pressure gain at the pump or the negative of the pressure loss at the pump. So this is a closed mesh. So this pressure drop plus this pressure drop plus this pressure drop should add to zero. But this pressure drop from two to zero is a gain actually is positive because it's a pump. That's what we put on the right hand side. So whatever the, the, the pump is gaining is being lost between zero and one and between one and two. All right. So essentially this would get rid of P1 in here. So we can say that P0 is equal to delta P of the pump plus P2, essentially eliminating another unknown, which is P0. So we've eliminated unknown Q1 and place it in terms of QA and QB, eliminated unknown Q2, place it in terms of QA and QB, and eliminated unknown P0 and put it in place of P2 and uh, delta P of the pump effectively eliminating three of the, of the unknowns from these equations. So if we go back to the equations, we'll have delta P of the pump. So from this equation right here, we can replace P0 with this, delta P of the pump plus P2 minus P1 is equal to LA dQA dt plus RA QA of t. C1 dP1 dt, second equation here, will replace Q1 with QA minus QB because that's what KCL said. Then third equation, there's nothing to change. We'll leave it in terms of P1 and P2 and QB. So P1 minus P2 is equal to LB dQB dt plus RB QB of t. And finally, the last equation, we'll place Q2 in terms of QB and QA. QB minus QA. All right. So now we, if we count the unknowns in these four equations, we have QA, P1, QB, and P2. So QA, P1, QB, and P2. These are the four unknowns in these four equations. And so now everything is consistent. We have four equations, four first order differential equations. 
with four unknowns. It's all a matter of rearranging and putting this in, in a way that we can actually implement it in the system and solve it, right? Everything else is known. So all the coefficients, LA, RA, C1, LB, RB, C2, and the delta P of the pump are all known. Everything else is just the state variables, what it's called, the unknowns. All right. All right, so let's continue. Now let's rearrange. So we have, remember to rearrange, what we have to do is isolate the first derivative on the left on every one of these equations. So we have dqa dt is equal to minus RA over LA times QA. So let's do it in simultaneous here. So I'm just solving for the QA DT. Um, minus one over LA times P1 of T plus zero times QB of T. Nothing multiplies QB. So these are the four unknowns in that order because we're going to end up with four equations for one for QA, one for P1, one for QB, one for P2. So we have to play the unknowns in that particular order. Plus one over LA times P2 plus one over LA times delta P of the pump, which is a known quantity on the right-hand side. That's equation number one. Equation number two is dp1 dt is equal to 1 over c1 times qa in that order. Nothing multiplies p1, so it's plus 0 times p1. Uh, min minus 1 over c1 times qb. And nothing multiplies p2. plus nothing on the right-hand side, plus zero. No independent term. Let's look at the third equation. dqb dt is equal to, so if we solve for dqb from here, um, nothing multiplies qa. Uh, multiplying p1 is one over lb, positive, plus one over lb times P1. Multiplying QB is um, RB over LB negative. And multiplying P2 would be negative 1 over LB, P2 of T, and nothing as an independent term. And finally, the last equation dp2 dt is equal to um, negative of 1 over c2 times qa, nothing multiplying p1, positive of 1 over c2 times qb, nothing multiplying p2, and 0 for an independent term. So these are the four equations with four unknowns rearranged in order in a particular way so that we can rewrite the system in the state form where on the left-hand side we have these four quantities, dqa dt, dp1 dt, dqb dt, and dp2 dt inside a vector and this is equal to a big matrix four by four matrix and on this matrix we have minus r a over l a minus one over l a zero and one over l a here we have one over c one zero minus one over C1, zero. Here we have zero, 
1 over LB minus RB over LB minus 1 over LB. And here we have minus 1 over C2, 0, 1 over C2, and 0. Okay. It's very important that we respect the order of the state variables, QA, P1, QB, and P2, so that this matrix is actually built properly. If we shift any of those quantities, the results will be completely off. If we miss any of these signs, the results will be completely off to the point that the system might not even converge to a solution. And all of these matrix actually multiplies the vector of unknowns, QA, P1, QB, and P2, plus a vector of independent terms, the first one being 1 over LA times delta P of the pump, 0, 0, and 0. So basically, that independent term on the first equation is driving the entire system. Notice that we cannot solve for any of these equations isolated from the rest. All these equations are coupled. We cannot solve for the Q, DQA, DT. We cannot solve for QA because we need P1 and we need P2. Okay, they're both present in that equation. We cannot solve for P1 because we need QA and QB. We cannot solve for QB because we need P1, QB, and P2. And we cannot solve for P2 because we need QA and QB. So all four equations are linked together, coupled together, and our only hope is to actually write them in this what's so-called state system of equations and try to apply these numerical integrators in a simultaneous fashion. So this can be summarized in the state system of equations like this. So we have unknowns, y of t, dot. So the dot denotes the derivative with respect to time. So on the left-hand side, we have a vector of derivatives. We have a matrix. A, which I'm going to denote as A as a function of time because we are these, these coefficients are allowed to actually be a function of time. And we'll see that in the, as we progress through the material. Times the vector of independent terms or state variables, the, the vector of uh, dependent variables or state variables, QA, P1, QB, and plus a right-hand side vector of independent terms, which is known. This is a coupled system of first order ODEs. And in this case is a system of four equations of four ODEs. But the method that we formulated applies to any size of ODE systems. All right. So So in order to solve the system, so we have the system of equations. We know that all these uh, equations are coupled to each other. We cannot solve them independently. We have to do it concurrently and within the same within the same loops. So we need to provide initial conditions. We need to provide initial conditions for all the state variables. That is, we need to know what the value of each of these y's is equal to a time equals zero. So what is QA a time equals zero? What is P1 a time equals zero? What is QB a time equals zero? And what is P2 a time equals zero? So these needs to be provided in order to arrive at, at a solution. Just remember the algorithm, the numerical integrator algorithm starts from the initial conditions and evolves in time and step time, time steps from there. So we test this system with the usual delta P of the pump. We have the sinusoidal wave and we're gonna let A, as usual, be 30 millimeters of mercury. B, which is the offset, is 90 millimeters of mercury. 
and omega, which is the frequency, is two pi radians per second. So, which is equivalent to one cycle, one cycle per second. So, this is essentially simulating a heart that is uh, oscillating between sixty and one hundred and twenty millimeters of mercury every second. Okay, uh, we're going to let R A equal to R B, which is equal to one millimeter of mercury per milliliter second. We're going to let L A equal to L B. We can play with these values actually when we implement this in, in MathCat. LA is equal to a B, and uh, we're going to let that 0 0.1, let that be 0 0.1 millimeters of mercury milliliters per second square or per second second. The two compliance we're also going to make equal to each other. Again, this is not a requirement. We can play with those values, make them completely different. It doesn't matter, but just to test. So the capacitance or compliance C1 and C2 are equal to each other. It's one milliliter. Um, mercury per uh, one, one milliliter per millimeter of mercury and the initial conditions by zero which again is equal to QA P1 QB and P2 is equal to zero 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 so we're going to let all initial conditions be zero and that's perfectly fine to have all initial conditions be homogeneous because the equation, the set of equations itself is non-homogeneous because we have this independent term here. So even if we start from the point where all the uh, flows and pressures are equal to zero, the system is going to come out of a trivial solution because we have a non-homogeneous term in the equations itself, okay? Otherwise, if all these terms were, would be equal to zero here, all this right-hand side, uh, vector of independent uh, terms will be zero. So the equations are homogeneous. So if these equations were homogeneous, we need at least one initial condition to be non-zero for the solution to be non-zero. So if we have equations and initial conditions, both homogeneous, the solution will always be trivial, essentially zero. All the answer for QA is a function of time, P1 is a function of time, QB is a function of time, and P2 is a function of time will all be zero. All right, so we're going to exercise this in lecture number or lecture 17 dot mathcat okay and this is what we're going to do next uh, i'm going to stop this recording and then we're going to go to the next part where i actually do screen capture of the of the mathcat uh, simulation all right so um this is the implementation of the formulation that we just uh, derived in class uh, for the uh, uh, system of the cardiovascular circuit that contains two RLC compartments in series. So we have uh, one resistor, one inductor in series with a compliance in parallel and another set just like that one. So um, this is uh, again continuation of lecture 17. One of the first things that I'm going to change uh, in this particular uh, MathCAD uh, spreadsheet uh, uh, it's different from, from the previous ones that I've gone over in class is the fact that I'm going to set the origin to 1. And what that basically does is, is by default in MathCAD, the origin is equal to 0. And the origin is, is essentially the first element on, a, on an array. So, so far, we've actually been starting every single array at position number 0. So what we're going to be doing now is starting at position number 1. So nothing changes. It's essentially the way we, we start the counting on the array. So arrays will start from position one onwards. Um, and we do this uh, just essentially to avoid confusion with the state system of equations, because from now on, we're going to have state system of equations. We're going to have four, six, eight, and more equations. And uh, we're going to have a, 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 little, a little inner loop in the algorithm to actually solve each equation independently. So, all right. So the first thing we do is start with the delta P of the pump which, uh, as usual, is a pump that produces, in, on this particular example, a pump that produces a maximum pressure of 120 and minimum pressure of 60 millimeters of mercury, is sinusoidal, with a frequency of one cycle per second, which we turn into a natural frequency of 2 pi times that frequency. The amplitude of that uh, signal is P max minus P min over 2, which is equal to 30 millimeters of mercury, and the offset of that signal is P max plus P min over 2, which is 90 millimeters of mercury. So essentially, the delta P of the pump is a function that will comprise the uh, amplitude uh, times the sinusoidal, sinusoidal wave with frequency omega plus the offset B. 
we're going to analyze the system all the way through uh, 10, 10 cycles, so a maximum of, of, of time equal 10 seconds. Uh, let's start with a actually let's start with a smaller number of uh, on a uh, number of uh, time steps, 100, so that each cycle comprises 10 time steps, and you can see that each cycle is very choppy here. So the size of the delta t is the t max divided by n, which is equal to 0 0.1. And since we're starting the arrays at origin equal 1, then we have to start the, uh, the counters at 1 instead of starting them at, at, at 0. So this these, uh, variable n um, it starts from 1 all the way to n plus 1, n plus 1 being the number of time steps. Okay, so we have 101 positions. And the array tn uses this range variable 1 to n plus 1 to start the position of, uh, of the array at 1. It's delta t times n minus 1. So if we print t, t is an array that, can, that starts at position 1 and has time equals 0. At position 2, it has time equals 0 0.1. And then we can scroll down through that array all the way to position 101, where we have 10 seconds. If we change the number of time steps, obviously this array will be different. And then we plot that the same way we plotted before. We plot this function delta p of time of the delta p of the pump uh, as a function of time from 0 to 10 and then uh, we get the distribution as a, I'm showing down here. Um, as you can see because we only have 10 time steps per cycle it looks very choppy but if you can we can increase that to a thousand and it will look a lot smoother or 10,000 it will look a lot smoother but remember that we're trying to find the best compromise between efficiency and accuracy and we'll see how, how accurate it is uh, if, we, if we just chop it at uh, 10 time steps per second. As we explained during the formulation, we're going to test this with uh, some values of resistance, inductance, and compliance. And we're going to make RA, L, LA, and C1 equal to these values, RB, LB, and C2 equal to these values. The capital K is the number of uh, state variables. So in this particular example, we have four state variables. So we're going to set K or capital K equal to four. You're going to see that K actually referenced to in the, in the, um, in the uh, uh, in the algorithm, um, then we introduce this matrix, which is a state matrix uh, for the set of equations and these two arrays. And I'm going to do this again for you, so that you see how you introduce a matrix in MathCat. I'm going to call the matrix A of T, even though none of the elements of that matrix are a function of time. Just to denote that we can actually make some of the elements of the matrix a function of time. So I'm going to make A of T equal to this is the definition equal or column. Uh, and I can insert a matrix, so just simply press Ctrl M, and I'm going to insert a matrix that has four rows and four columns. And in the four rows and four columns, I'm going to go to my notes, and I'm going to say the elements of this matrix are, the first one is minus RA, um, R dot A over L dot A. The second one is minus 1 over L dot A, the third one is 0, and the third one is 1 over L dot A. Here we have 1 over C1, or C dot 1. We have 0 minus 1 over C dot 1, and 0. In the third row, we have 0, 1 over L dot B, uh, minus RB, B over L dot B. Remember the math cat is case dependent, so it's important to use the caps when the definition calls for it. L dot B. And in the fourth row, we have minus 1 over C2, 0, 1 over C2, actually C dot 2, and 0. This is the way I define these quantities with uh, the uh, subscript dot a dot b dot one and dot two all right so that's the matrix if we forget to introduce any of the coefficients we'll get an error so for example if this zero we forget to introduce that zero we'll get a red sign saying that we need something in there so it's zero likewise for b i'm going to introduce a matrix same thing Control m and introduce a matrix that has four rows and one column and in the first row i'm going to say is one over l dot a times b 
delta, which is capital D, control G, P of the pump with respect to time. And as you can see, this is a function of time, and therefore the elements of an array are allowed to be functions of time if you describe the array itself or the matrix as a function of time. All right, so the, the rest of the elements are all zero. And we can do this again for the initial condition, y.o, or initial condition, control M, a matrix with four rows and one column, and each of the elements is equal to zero. Okay. All right, so there's the algorithm. Now in the algorithm, the difference between this algorithm and the one before is that within the calculation of every one of the components of the runge kuta predictors and correctors, K1, K2, K3, and K4, we're going to have an inner loop that goes from 1 to capital K, basically calculate K1, K2, K3, and K4, or basically calculate all, all four values of K1 for all four state variables, then use those in calculating all four values of K2 for all four state variables, because remember K1 participates in the calculation of the corrector K2, K2 participates in the calculation of the corrector K3, and so on and so forth. So download this file and analyze uh, how this, this is actually this actually takes place. Look, uh, notice that all uh, loops start at position one because I changed the origin to one. So we loop from K equal one through K to start with and assign now the solution Y1 is going to have a row and a column. Uh, I'm sorry, it's going to have a, it's an array of two of, of two indices. The first index, uh, index is the position in time and the second index is the actual state variable. So Y, the solution Y, is an, is an array that has two positions. The first position again denotes the position in time and the second position denotes the state variable itself. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually filling out the solution Y, the first element of solution Y with each of the state variable initial conditions, Y0 of K, okay? Then I loop over time from position number one to position number N, calculate the predictors for each of the, uh, for each of the state variables K, calculate the correctors K2 for each of the state variables K, calculate the correctors, the correctors, and notice that these correctors, uh, these predictors and correctors are functions of the state variable uh, A or, or the state matrix A and the right-hand side vector uh, and the right-hand side vector B. Okay, so just analyze this, uh, this, uh, this flow, uh, this, this code is very similar to the one we had before. It's just now generalized to solve any size of system of equations from one to K. Okay. So regardless of the size of the matrix A, regardless of how many state variables we have, how many flows and how many pressures we have in the system, we declare that in this variable K equal four, and then we fill out the state matrix and the vector, the right hand side vector and the initial conditions, and they all come into place in this, in this code. And at the end of the day, you basically return after you looped through all the time steps, you return Y. So Y basically is a three dimensional array. It's an array that contains the solutions for all four state variables on all 101 positions in time. So if I were to print Y, I get this representation of a matrix that has four columns, each of them being the four state variables, and it has 101 rows. If I click on it and scroll down, you'll notice that there's 101 no rows those are essentially the 101 uh, time steps from time step one being the initial location to time step 101 that's after 10 seconds this is y1 which is qa this is y2 which is p1 this is y3 which is qb and this is y4 which is the pressure two in the circuit and that's those that's a correspondence between the state variables one two three and four and the actual state variables in the circuit because that's the way we formulated the set of equations and build the matrix A. Okay. Now we need to extract each of these columns and plot them because column one and column three are the two flows, QA and QB, and column two and column four are the two pressures, pressure one and pressure two. And we cannot plot pressures and flows in the same plot. So what we'll do after these, after we return Y into solution y and now we're not going to be able to calculate um, uh, errors or 
We're not going to be able to calculate uh, uh, L2 norms or anything like that because we don't have the exact solution. There's actually no way to calculate the exact solution for this particular problem, as this problem uh, is just one that requires uh, this, this, this particular type of numerical integration. So as I said, um, column number one and column number three of the, of the uh, state variable Y, of the array Y, the solution, are QA and QB. So what we'll do in order to extract that information, to extract column one, is just simply say cube A is equal to Y, control six, one. So control six accesses a specific column of an array. So QB is equal to the solution Y, control six, the third column of array number, of the array Y. And then all I need to do it's just plot QA and QB as a function of time using the in the or the range variable n. Remember, n is a range variable that goes from 1 to n plus 1. So, or from time equals 0 to 10 seconds. So you can see now QA and QB both starts at 0, as expected, because both initial conditions were 0. And they actually go up, and then they actually settle down to an asymptotic solution. Asymptotic is an oscillative solution in this case. But notice that none of them neither QA nor QB go negative. Remember that QA is the flow that passes to the resistance A and inductance A, and QB, the blue one here, is the one that passes through resistance B and inductance B. And none of them go negative, as the case we saw before that had the compliance or the, 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 the capacitor in series, with the, in series with the resistor and the inductors. In this particular case, they actually are doing the job that is expected, which is essentially absorbing some of the flow and releasing some of the flow. If we want to know what the amount of flow being absorbed and released by, by the first compliance, remember Q1 is equal to QA plus QB, according to our formulation. And Q2, which is the flow going into the second compliance, is equal to QB minus QA. So you can add and subtract these two and know exactly how much flow is going to one or re being released from one or being absorbed by each of the two compliances. And you'll see that those two actually go negative. But from our, for our intents and purposes, those are the flows absorbed and released in actually emulating the compliance and the contraction of the vessel. This is exactly what the flow is doing uh, inside those vessels. All right. We also need to access uh, column number two and column number four of the solution array Y, and those are pressure one and pressure two. So remember, pressure one is right after the pump, while pressure two is right after the uh, the the first uh, the, the first set of resistors and compliance. Actually, P1 is after the first set of resistors and compliance, the first compartment, and P2 is after the second set of resistors and compliance. So P1 is the pressure that is connected to the uh, to compliance number one, and P2 is the pressure that is connected to compliance number two. If we plot these over time, we notice that pressure one is positive, while pressure two is negative. That's no problem, because what matters is the difference between P1 and P2, plus the difference between P0 and P1 should be equal to the pressure gain on the pump, which is this one right here. Um, also notice that what the compliance are basically doing, or the equation of the compliance dictates that once this slope is positive, the compliance or the capacitor is actually absorbing flow. Once it's zero, like in, it flattens out right here, it actually, there's no flow going into or out of the compliance. Once the pressure re is uh, decreases as a function of time, the PDT, the P1 dt is equal to negative to a negative number, then the compliance is actually absorbing flow. And it continues to do that in this particularly synchronized manner that is dictated by essentially the frequency of these is dictated by what the pump is actually doing, which is driving the whole flow, the whole system. The whole system on the circuit is being driven by what the pump is dictating. All right. Now, there's nothing to compare these two. There's no analytical solution. There's no exact solution to compare these pressures and these flows to. So we have to trust them. So how do we know that these are right? How do we know that these are in fact the solutions to this particular circuit under these particular conditions, with these initial conditions, with these particular parameters? Well, we don't know. We have to trust them. We have to use some, some uh, knowledge. We have to use some, uh, some, some physicality to be able to determine whether these, or to be able to assess whether these solutions are indeed correct or not. One way of doing so is through the numerics, okay? Are these solutions actually converged? Well, let's look at these numbers, 
Okay, this is about an average is about 20. This is an average about minus 20. This flow QA is an average somewhere around 50 or so, and the blue one is also around 50. It just has a little bit less oscillation. So what would happen if I go to, for example, 10 times more time steps? N equal 1,000. Okay, I know I will get a better solution, but the solution has to be within the same order of magnitude as I had before in order to actually be able to ascertain that the solution is actually converging. It's converging to a value. So the more time steps I put in, the more accurate the solution is expected to be, but the more accurate with respect to a final solution. So let's see if I use a thousand time steps, I should expect a much better solution, smoother, and indeed is a solution that actually converges to the same average values as I had before. QA goes up, QB goes up from zero, and they actually settle around 50, milli 50 milliliters per second. Both of them settle around 50 or so milliliters per second. That's the average. And that average is actually maintained. Same for the pressures. So this is an indication, again, not that the solution is correct, but that at least the numerical algorithm is converging to a value. See, the pressure one is around 20 in average, and the pressure two is around minus 20 in average. They both start with zero. So at least we're satisfying the initial conditions and we're converging to a solution. If I add more time steps to this, let's say 10,000, I hope this doesn't crash. This is gonna take a little while, actually, it's done. But notice, yes, there's a lot more points in the solution. There's a lot more time steps. There's 10,000 and one time steps. But notice the solution is converging to the same exact values or around an average of 50 milliliters per second in the flows and an average of about 20 and minus 20 for the pressure. So this is a good indication that the solution is converging to the right value, that the solution is correct. Okay, so go back. This, uh, this um, spreadsheet has been, this MathCAD spreadsheet has been posted on Canvas. Make sure you download it and play with it and alter the parameters and see, see what it does. Again, if you change any of these parameter locations or change any of these signs, there's no guarantee that you would even converge to a solution. So if you one indication that you did something wrong in the formulation would be to start looking at increasing the number of time steps and seeing if that solution converges to a physically correct value or not. And if it doesn't, it's basically because our system is some, somehow incorrect. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I'll see you next lecture.